I'm in, I'm in the economic development world, but I'm actually, I came to this session, not to the other session, because I think everything starts with place. So maybe if you guys want to elaborate on that, and especially after the comment you were making, Dan, about, about the, uh, the place you created at the market. And before, Dan, you, you respond, I, I think it's a very good point, and it's one that um, is not absorbed. Are the people from West Virginia here? Yes, we had this conversation yesterday uh, where economic de development offices and state capitals are full of people who don't believe that place uh, comes first. But if you look at the research and you look at research with most the most mobile people in America, the people who are actually, you're at risk of losing or you can't actually move to your city, uh, they 66% of them say first they choose the place they want to live, then they look for a job, and that just flies in the face of all the old economic development wisdom, and we haven't yet absorbed that, particularly in the economic development world. So Dan, jump in. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I spent, before I got to Detroit, I spent 20 years doing downtown development work in places like Rack Island, Illinois, and uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, that had kind of cool downtowns. Um, the, the economy had blown up, and to any success they still have had in recovery, and I wouldn't say it's complete by any means. Those towns are really focused on their core assets and tried to build up the aesthetics and the sense of place. It, it was really a, a prerequisite. I don't think it's enough energy for some of those towns to be the purpose for it goes forward. But I don't think they'll attract the people to create that purpose if they don't do that as the first step. So I, I got kind of stymied by trying to do great placemaking and having no customers for my retail businesses. But I think you, you can only, Sorry, excuse me. if you just put the retail business there without any regard for placemaking, they, they would fail sooner, quicker, faster. So I think, it's, I think the order is right, but I think that just begins the gestation period of trying to figure out what, what, what you're going to be when you grow up again. Other questions? Yes. Um, I'm Andrea from Lexington, Kentucky. Question for Jamie. Um, is it, how important is it for the artists themselves to understand their role with community development? Is it, is it important to define that for them and to teach them about that? Or is it one of those kind of organic things that just happens and somebody else plays the liaison role? Yeah, no. So I think one of the things that's most important to understand about the creative placemaking work is that you're at least talking about having a bilingual conversation that many arts people don't have the grounding and the basis to understand many much of Community Development 101, and a lot of Community Development folks don't have the grounding to understand um, sort of Arts 101. That's not entirely true. There are some who knew both. And so one of the things that we've done to help artists into that conversation is we have 10 sectors of community planning and development that we track. They're not magical, there's nothing sort of mystical about them, but they cover a lot of the work that happens in communities. So economic development, workforce development, housing, transportation, public safety, public health, uh, environment and energy, agriculture and food, um, immigration, et cetera. It's a matrix you've seen. And so artists can plug into that in different ways. So in Tacoma Park, Maryland, we have dancers and choreographers partnering with the local Department of Transportation to do corridor planning because the dancers and the choreographers understand how human bodies move through space, and they bring that knowledge alongside traffic engineers. In Minneapolis St. Paul, an artist that works with a lot of young people was invited to address one of the most dangerous intersections where more shootings happened than anyone else. And what this artist and the young people figured out is that no one shoots anyone in the face if there are soap bubbles blowing. So they literally put a soap bubble machine on the side of a building, and whether it was people gathering to look at it, whether it was a change of the narrative, whether it was attention being paid, there's a way that artists were able to move forward a public safety narrative. Now, take that example. It's much more complicated than that because did you just displace the violence by a block, right, in which case you didn't solve the problem, or did you actually decrease the amount of violence that was happening? So it is exactly the right question, and it's one we spend a lot of time on. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, I, I just want to follow up on that question because um, I presume those are examples that art place is funding. Mm -hmm. Fair. Um, so, what happens when art place funding ends? Do you what do you think you have to demonstrate to 
city officials, state officials, wherever you're placing people, that this stuff matters. So our job isn't to make creative placemaking happens when it's a special grant funded thing. It's not a special kind of community development. It should be one of the standard tools of community planning and development 101. So our goal is to take the language and the outcomes of each of those 10 sectors and show how arts and culture can help achieve those more efficiently, more effectively, or more comprehensively. And so through our research programs, we're doing a deep dive into each of those sectors. We've begun the first two with housing and with public safety to begin showing how arts and culture can decrease gun violence, how it can help with community reentry, how it can prevent recidivism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is several cases. I don't think it's one case. So I think we have a different case to make to transportation planners than we do to immigrants officials than we do to public safety officials. And essentially the case is this works. So if you are trying to do this and you have money to achieve this outcome, include artists in it as well. The, the other example that I just love giving also from St. Paul is that they put an artist in residence in the Department of Planning who took a look at how city agencies were doing community engagement. Right? And we all know how city agencies do community engagement. You have a meeting at City Hall at 3 o'clock on a Monday, you and the one Fakakta woman. Right, right, exactly. Sign in and wait for the one Fakakta woman with the dog in the pothole to show up and do the speech she does, and right, not much happens. So this artist took one of the city fleet of vehicles and retrofitted it as a popsicle truck. And now when city agencies want community input and engagement, they send a popsicle truck out and they hand out free popsicles in exchange for surveys, right? So every city agency has money to do community engagement and outreach. Why not include artists as one of the kinds of community organizers who could do that? So we're trying to do this with regular, we're, our move is to get this done with regular money, not with special money. Great, got a question right here, then I'll go to the back here and there. I said this, I almost pretty much answered it, but just any more narratives on the group. A lot of times, I'm Keith Selling from the city of Milwaukee. When you talk about creative placemaking, you talk about bringing artists in the community, sometimes you hear feedback from our residents, well, I'm looking for a job. You know, how, why is it that if you go 10 miles away from my neighborhood in the suburbs, when people need jobs, they create jobs, but within my community, they're having us plant gardens and paint on walls when we need jobs. You kind of answer a little bit, though, with that conversation with the, uh, earlier, but if you have any other thoughts well, to it. And the one thing that I would just push on in the setup of your question is it's so interesting that whenever I talk about this work, people start with, oh, so you're going to bring artists into my neighborhood. Artists aren't these foreign things that live somewhere else and are waiting to parachute in. Right, Artists live in neighborhoods. So as much of this work is done by local artists as it is by outside artists, and sometimes one is right and sometimes the other. There's a great example in Kivalina, Alaska, where a group of people have been trying to save the same problem for 40 years, and they finally brought in an outside artist to disrupt their thinking. They wanted someone who was from outside the system to help them see the system and understand it. So. Absolutely 100%. And the only thing I would just underscore is artists are not always these aliens waiting to parachute down and ruin life for real people. Somebody, um, somebody confronted uh, Theaster Gates, the social practice artist in, in Chicago, was, uh, was on uh, television, I think, last week in local television in Chicago. And there was a live studio audience, and someone confronted him in a very kind way. I mean, he said, same thing, I, I need a job. How do I get a job based on this enterprise you're creating? Omar, did you see that? It, uh, anyway, it's posted on my Facebook page. But um, it's a very difficult question, right? That would be a difficult question for a city official. That would be a difficult question you know, for almost anyone, right? Unless I've, I've, I've got a job to hand out that day. The Astra actually had a pretty good response. And I'll, if you'll give me your card, I'll send you the link. Yes. In the back, yes. You. Sorry. How you doing? I'm Tanae Trailer. I'm with the Candida Fund in Atlanta. It's slash nationally. Um, I'm curious. Are there what examples have you seen of creative placemaking in the American South? And um, kind of give us kind of your kind of opinions on that and how we can increase that. Yeah, so I, we are lucky enough that we've invested in something like 229 projects across 43 states. So we've seen creative placemaking happen in every kind of community. So we've got investments in Georgia, North Carolina, Texas. You know, we can sort of run through it. And I haven't seen 
a lot of difference between how it operates in southern communities and other communities. The one big thing that I'll say is that a lot of cultural infrastructure looks different in the south, and there aren't necessarily the same kinds of formal purpose-built spaces like major performing art centers that are always the basis for that activity. And there's an interesting, I can't remember who did it, but there's an interesting reading that actually says that cultural development followed development of the railroads. And when the South didn't get um, involved with the railroad development, it missed out on a lot of that cultural development as well. But it's still happening, right? It doesn't have to happen in a major performing arts center. Arts and culture happens in churches and school basements, in outside and yards. So I've seen it happen, and I'm happy to walk you through specific examples um, of things that we've seen in southern communities. For any lessons, it'd be useful. Okay, as a Memphis, southerner, Memphis, I've, I've got to push Memphis. back on push that. We, we, we actually do have cultural centers. We don't. We don't. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, no. no I, sorry. Hello. No, and I was. Uh, no, I was not saying there are none. I'm just saying the cultural infrastructure I've seen across the South looks different than it looks across the Northeast. East, okay. that it doesn't, there aren't as many Lincoln centers and they're not needed. I will, we'll, we can cut that <laughs> Uh, As a now fellow Memphian of Carol's, uh, I knew that was coming, so um, I'm grateful for it. I'm Leslie Smith from Memphis. Um, You've sort of scratched me to think about something around equity, inclusion, and balance in representation. So we're talking a lot about power structures and the tables we set for community engagement, and I love your comment about involving artists in all of these conversations because of the the different angles of thinking. Um, So my question is, have you considered as an element of your work a movement around inclusion, diversity, um, equity, which which intentionally looks at the addition of artists to that sort of spectrum? Because I think there may be value in that. So probably the most important question and probably one of the most complicated, right? We are all living in a country where those issues impact everything that happens in this country. Community development is a set of systems and structures that are impacted greatly by issues of equity. And arts and culture is a system that has a lot of structural racism issues and a lot of equity issues. So when you take a broken system and merge it with another broken system, it doesn't automatically become magically perfect. So one of the questions that's interesting to me is that people who tend to gravitate toward this work are interested in working in new ways because something hasn't been working. So I really believe that there is an opening and an opportunity there for folks that want to do things differently, that it doesn't have to look like it looked 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. So I think the opportunity is there. I don't have anything profoundly to say about it, except we need to think about it, we need to talk about it, we need to make sure it's in every conversation we're having in one, the other, or when they merge. Question back you. Thank you. Nikki Yervin with the California Community Foundation, just down the street here in downtown LA. Um, Dan, I loved your comment about you have to bake equity into everything. I wonder about how do you bake economic sustainability into everything, realizing the fragility of these entrepreneurs that uh, you're supporting at the Eastern Market. How do you support artists who often glorify living on a shoestring um, how do we really build longevity into those efforts? Good question, and that really relates more to the tenant mix of the Sunday market, mm-hmm. which are a mix of make-it-yourselfers and artisans. And the answer is uh, uh, our own capacity. We're, we're trying to learn how to do entrepreneurial support in the food space, and then learn those lessons and apply it to the art space. So we're, we're just, we haven't gotten far enough down the road yet. We do have a micro grants program that we've opened up to the artist community, but that's, I'm sure there's gonna be many more things we learn as we, but we have learned about incubators is that um, having a really low cost, wonderful, fully licensed kitchen is great, but if you don't have the flavors of technical assistance to go to support the entrepreneurs, then, so that same lesson would be, I would say the technical assistance on the business side to artists is probably among the things we're looking at first, mm-hmm. we're just trying to find a financial wherewithal to be able to expand into, it would, th- those would require a new set of technical assistance providers, typically unless it's just core marketing or financial services, but I think you want some successful artists, the peer-to-peer piece of it I think is important too. 
Dan, maybe could you go a little bit deeper into the concept of curating a collection of places? I think that you, you briefly mentioned it, but can you talk and give some examples of what you're I trying just, to do in that space? Uh, place making seems so simplistic, like it's one place. It's, yeah. I feel the same way about community. When I hear the word community, mm -hmm. as if it's monolithic, I just go ballistic inside. So I think market's a, a big neighborhood. We have at least four or five different kinds of places, not many more specific places, but yeah, I think in city planning, downtown development, we don't do enough, particularly in not thriving markets, of saying, we got one chance to have a great retail street. Let's put all of our focus on this two block section to make it compelling before we start trying to fill storefronts anywhere else. And then we have a, there are different flavors of streets, but you, I think you just have to really leverage your resources as best you can. Uh just to follow on to that question, and there's a question here in the red and then right behind him. Uh, but I was thinking earlier, Dan, is there a minimum viable uh, footprint for a market? Or, you know, in other words, if you don't have this many stalls, don't have any stalls at all, it won't work? I think, it's I think that minimum size is relevant. Uh, is re it depends on the market you're serving. So there are some really excellent small town markets that have 20 stallholders. The, the people come out every Saturday morning, hundreds of them, it's the event of the week in that particular market. Right. So you know, Detroit, people call Detroit a food desert. I would argue it's more of a place desert than a food desert. Mm. That Detroit has, because it's lost so many of its commercial infrastructure buildings are vacant, now it's changing quickly in the work on liver noise. It's very actually talking to Omar, who's done work on a place called Live Six, which is by one of the universities in Detroit. We're actually talking with them about bringing them a weekly farmer's market this year to help their placemaking initiatives so that you can combine the energy of a market, which we had one in that neighborhood, way far away from the best commercial strip that, that benefited nobody and nobody came. So again, markets properly cited can help the businesses around them, but that doesn't happen necessarily by accident. You gotta really work on that. I'd also argue that one thing we're trying to do next in our next shed renovation is to combine um, 60 units of workforce housing with our next shed renovation. We're doing that partly because we're gonna be separating the wholesale function. We have a little bit more focus on retail and residential, but we also believe it's a huge model for those cities that have a successful transient farmer's market in a parking lot. What's the next step? And if you can, build a market hall and use, if it's 80% of the footprint of the building is housing, you can use housing to finance, you can cut your capital costs, and if you create a successful housing project upstairs, you now have long-term operating support for the farmer's market as well, because even if we just ran the market, we could cover about 75% of our costs. We do, when we add programs for food entrepreneurship, for neighborhood revitalization, for uh, food access work, we're currently at about a third of our own earned income. And our goal is to go grow some of these activities as profit centers so we can get back up to about 75%, but that's going to take us five to 10 years to get there. Just trying to, to get a sense from you, to what degree do you feel the building of social capital more at the block or neighborhood level is essential to then to get to some of the ideas that you're presenting um, with the more the economic strategies that would support um, an area? And how, how would maybe, how is that being done? So on our end, we work, we encounter that a lot. Um, in addition to running the market, we also have birthed a network of neighborhood farmers markets in Detroit that are in places like this Livernoy six mile area. And they're, they're very, often there's hardly a heartbeat um, of activity around those markets. Over five years, we've, we've learned a lot of really, um, it's, it's really groundwork. I mean, it's really trying to get the local, we, we don't take our pop-up markets anywhere that someone hasn't invited us to come. And so we can bring fresh fruits and vegetables, we can bring some vendors along with us, but we rely on the neighborhood partner to do those things to create an event at the time and place that we show up. And it's, it's really um, basic rent work. It's, it's, it's doorknob hangers. It's working with churches in the area. You know, seniors and kids are, are two audiences that often are good for neighborhoods to start with because they tend to be there 
more of the time than people who are working. So uh, it, it's really trench warfare trying to get, creating a safe place, which I think the arts has a huge role to play if there's security issues in the neighborhood. Creating a safe place and then creating an attractive place with more than one thing to do besides come to a farmer's market. People, particularly the higher income levels, but it's starting to shift down into all income groups, they're paying more attention to what they eat. And so the opportunity around cooking demonstrations and trying to demystify cooking. I mean, one of the big errors people make in the culinary arts is trying to pretend that people are really interested in the next top chef. They're not. Most people are embarrassed about not knowing which way to hold a knife to cut a, a piece of melon. And so dumbing down to really the basics level, because I, I own restaurants for 10 years. I run a market for 10 years. And I'm as kitchen illiterate as anybody in the room. Uh, so people don't necessarily, we, we assume people know more about food than they do. And so creating those opportunities to not just have food for sale, but have the, have the car that has an easy to prepare menu, having uh, someone, you know, there's a lot of movement in healthcare now because of Obamacare about having to come up with wellness programs around dietitians and others in the healthcare industry now trying to work with people on, a, on the ground level. So there's a lot of opportunities to create this healthier culture really by social interaction, but also literally by what we're eating. I've spent the last 20 years of my life dedicated to getting kids outside, urban kids outside. And we've created in Milwaukee, I run a place called the Urban Ecology Center, a, a series of incredible places that, that uh, you know, are hundreds of thousands of people are coming through now, but it's all landscape and parks. And I haven't actually heard, so I've, I've been trying to figure out where do I fit in? I mean, when I think of the creative placemaking movement or whatever it is, I, I think that's, it's all, for me, it's about green space. Um, and we incorporate a lot of creative art in the, in the process of it, but I, but I haven't heard that commentary, and it's, and, it's, and it's my personal belief that every neighborhood needs a place for people to have sanctuary, you know, to, to, to get out and, and be, and, and that attracts people to wanting to live in that place. Uh, but I haven't heard that in the creative place-making dialogue, and I'm just curious um, if I'm just missing it, or if you've thought about it, or, or where your thoughts are with that. Yeah, so there are a set of really interesting projects that are more sort of better understood in the open space, natural environment setting. So in Anchorage, Alaska, there's not a strong tradition of people engaging with the municipal park system, right? People tend to go out and you'll go on a, a, up a glacier or you'll go out, but you won't come together in the parks that are right there in Anchorage. So the Light Brigade in Artist Collective got together to do a series of projects to bring Anchorageans, Anchorageites, Alaskans, um, together in their parks. Um, really interesting project that 11 tribes have got, Native American tribes have gotten together to do in the Grand Canyon that's actually partnering with the National Park Service to say that there's actually a human history and a human present here in the Grand Canyon, not just a natural one. And so they actually want to celebrate the human history and the human culture of the Grand Canyon because all of those 11 tribes go back to it. And in one of, I just think, one of the most interesting uses of public art, when Boston created the Rose Kennedy Greenway, they were literally creating space that didn't used to exist, right? Because they had covered over and, and made a new greenway. So they were commissioning a series of monumental works of temporary public art so they would attract people to the space and then three months later give them a chance to come back and then three months later give them another excuse to come back as they were mapping that space. So I think it's really interesting and there are a lot of, um, the Trust for Public Land is actually doing some really interesting work and thinking in this area thanks to Kresge. And I would just add that um, I glanced over the project but the De Quinter Cut project, I talked about more about the bikes and the, the greenway but the sanctuary aspect of that is huge, it really is completely being away from the city, you're sunken down, you're disconnected. And as we see that new industrial area that we want to develop, which is very green, we see uh, a series of greenways off that spine that would combine stormwater management with recreational amenity um, in a way that would, would create additional, you know, the, the best data I've seen, in term, and, and this is where that and economic development merge, um, 50% of the people who live in golf course communities don't play golf. They simply don't want to look at, at the clothesline in their neighbor's backyard. And so to me, as we look at the east side of Detroit with all this vacant land, how could you create value there? To me, the greenways is a huge piece 
to create a, a footprint that people would pay a premium for if there is a permanent uh, greenway associated with it. Help me thank our we want panelists.